wonderful exotic location that is the kitchen in my house in Benoni. Hello, a warm welcome to you. This is another episode of the Coaching Hour podcast, although I think we're going to stop calling it a podcast because, well, you can see us and generally with a podcast, it's just audio. So I'm not exactly sure what you would call this, but we have four people who have gathered around uh, our laptops and our phones in our respective homes across the country to bring you this another wonderful edition of the Coaching Hour. Uh, it's brought to you in partnership with Coaches Network South Africa. I'm Paul Rotherham. Lovely to have you with us. Let me introduce our core coaches team first off, and that is Mary and Mareka. Hello, Damas. Hello. Hello. Nice to have you with us. And as always, I'm going to hand over the baton of introduction to Mareka because well, she's just better prepared for this than I am. <laughs> okay, good. So today we have Alsha Dipisi with us, and uh, we're very fortunate to have her this morning because she's actually the only registered smart step family therapist in South Africa. And today we're going to talk about making blended families work, which is such an important topic, myself being in that situation and many of my friends that I know being in that same position as well. So welcome. Alsha. Marika, thank you for having me this morning. Um, good morning, Mary and Paul. Um, Marika, if you don't mind, I'd like to just um, mention that the surname is actually Duplessis Basson for a very specific okay. reason. It's oh, part yes. of the step family dynamic. <laughs> that is very true, yes. And I'm sure that's one of the reasons why you are very passionate about this topic. So tell us a bit more about this topic and why you specifically are so passionate about it. Okay, so um, from a personal experience, myself being a single parent for 10 years and then moving into a step family and we have this unrealistic expectations of what we think this marriage is now gonna be like. We know what we did wrong in our previous marriage. So we, we think we're gonna do it differently and that's gonna work. But what we never took into consideration was the children that precedes the wedding as well as the hurt that the children has experienced from a previous divorce from the parents. So obviously I have walked this journey personally myself and because I didn't have the, the tools or the skills how to navigate those dynamics in our step family, it initially caused a lot of hurt and um, harm, should I say, to, to everyone in the family. And, and there was one thing that I kept on saying, I said, if I don't want anybody else to wait 10 years for a new partner and then experience this rude awakening shortly after marriage. So out of this hurt, my passion was born for step families and people that's gone through divorce and obviously the children as well. Mm. And we don't always think about it, although obviously our children are part of our families, but yourself having gone through a divorce and entering a new relationship and you are all excited and in love yeah. And not always thinking about, you know, the effect this has on the children as well. Um, and later on, why do you believe does it, you know, is it so challenging for blended families to come together? So if we look at the, the hurt that the children experience, um, we as the parents of those children, we've gone through divorce and then we tend to say, my kid is so resilient. They've handled it so well. But first of all, we've depending on the age of the children, we've never helped them through the process of that divorce. Secondly, most of these children um, don't have the emotional intelligence to work through what they experience in that divorce. So now as a single parent, you tend to set your own traditions, your own habits, your own routine in your home. And then after a while, you meet someone. So here's the, the big thing that causes a lot of conflict. I might choose my new partner. We, we are focused on each other. We built a relationship. We're interested in each other. The children does not necessarily choose this new step parent because they are actually very happy to have their mom or dad's undivided attention. Now, so what happens when I enter the picture, they feel threatened by me. It's not the, the person that I am, but it's the position that I've taken in. They've already lost the unity between mom and dad. So most of the time, these kids are scared of experiencing more loss. They see this person as somebody that might take my mom away or somebody that might take my dad away. And it's normal instinct. If I feel that person is going to threaten my relationship with somebody else, 
I will push that person out. So if we think logically about it, it makes sense. But we don't take this into account when we move into a relationship. And we never discuss this with the children as well. Like you said, they don't always have a choice or they don't actually have a choice. So when you work with blended families, do you start then dealing, you know, first working with um, the, the parents or the couple or do you start working with the children? Um, how do you normally go about? Okay, so first of all, I always start with the parents because the, the first rude awakening that you will experience in a step family is the unrealistic expectations that we had of how this relationship is now going to work. I think my husband and I will be like this. We are a team. Um, and then we think everything else will just fall into place. So we have unrealistic expectations. And part of that unrealistic expectations is how I think my husband's children will respond to me and how they will treat me. So first of all, I open up the, try and open up the eyes of the parents. That's my first session, dealing with the unrealistic expectations. And then in our second session, I bring um, the attention to how the children experience this step family life. Um, and if we think about it, nobody's experienced more loss than stepchildren or kids from divorce. And if the parents or the, the parent, people going into the relationship or into this marriage are aware of the, the feelings that the children experience, it guides them how to avoid certain situations and how to see things from a different perspective. If you get um, a negative attitude from the child, you will it will remind you, but this is not about me. It's about he's experiencing loss again. I'm just making him aware of that. So, and then if we have that um, in the back of our minds, we tend not to take every situation personally. So my first, I start with the step parents and then afterwards working through a process with them, dealing with the discipline, um, who's responsible for discipline, because that's also a big thing. And then communication and conflict. Then after we, we have a discussion where the kids are involved, obviously we have to always take into account the age of the children. I always say the smaller the kids and the, depending on the amount of time I was a single parent, the easier it is to adapt for those children. But the older the children are, the more, the more I, I should say, pushback you, you would experience from those kids because now they have a voice. And especially in the era that our kids grow up now, they are very aware that, that I have a voice, I have an opinion, I'm allowed to say how I feel. And um, that's part of the process, how we guide these people to, to allow these children to also have a say um, and that, not to force things down on them um, because they've already experienced this from the divorce. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Elsie, if, if I may jump in here with a question, and I hope I'm, I'm not jumping the gun and, and skipping ahead too far, but to what extent should we be listening to our children in the sense that if we're getting into a new relationship and for whatever reason, our children really dislike this new partner, we're hopelessly in love, we think we've met Mr. or yeah. Mrs. Right, all the signs are pointing in the right direction, but just for an example, let's say our early teenage children, let's say we have a boy and a girl from a previous relationship, they really cannot stand this person. They're doing all that they can to sabotage the relationship. Is this already a sign that this blended family will never work and we should exit stage left? Or is this part and parcel of a normal process where a year or two down the line from that, you could actually have a family that's really well adjusted? What, what's your experience with that? Okay, so Paul, you've asked a brilliant question. So um, you asked the question, should, how much should we allow the children to, to raise their opinions? So first of all, as a parent, I need to understand where this feeling is coming from, from the child. So they're saying this for a reason. So if we get behind the, the feeling, most of the times we will uncover that it's actually they're afraid of losing mom or dad. So there's a loss. They feel threatened by this person. It's not so much that they don't like the person. Sometimes, depending if the, the potential step parent comes across very authoritarian, then definitely. Um, I sat with a couple last night again where 
they've they've been married now for I think three months, four months, and this stepdad is coming across. You will do this. You will do that. And it's in those situations where we preempt that. Listening to our kids, what are you afraid of if we do get married? What are you going to miss? So if we know what's behind this, we can navigate that. But secondly, Paul, you, you mentioned something. So first, should we then exit this relationship? I can tell you this. No other relationship is going to be any better or any easier because there's a past here. And with that past, you take in not just your children, but you take in the ex-wife or the ex-partner, the ex-parents-in-law and, and parents. So depending on how big that dynamic is, that's the family um, genogram that we see, that depends how long it will take for this step family then to start blending. So you mentioned, well, would we then see in one to two years that this family will come together and they will have a, a happy life? If we look at realistic factors, it takes more or less up to seven years for step family to start functioning, as we say, normal, okay? If we have that in the back of our minds, then we know um, the expectation that we're going to be an instant happy family is not real. I've got to take my family and every, every step family. There's no one, one recipe that's going to work for every step family. We've got to take every step family and work the dynamics that they experience. If we sit with a child where the father or the mother never featured, this child is going to experience more loss, more hurt. We have to take that into account. So definitely the children's opinion matter. It does matter. But we need to understand where that's coming from. Is it from a place of fear? Or is it from a place of really not liking this person? And then understanding why I don't like this person. In the instance where you, the child might say, but this person is, is very angry all the time. Or just... He just commands instructions for me and disciplines me. And it's important then to remember a parent or a step parent can only discipline when there's a relationship of trust and love. That doesn't come naturally the moment we say, I do. It doesn't. <laughs> I think as well, there's something to, to highlight here is that nothing is ever guaranteed to be perfect, even in a non-blended relationship. If you look at how many mother-in-law jokes there are where people joke about having the world's worst parents-in-law. Uh, and I can happily say that Zena's mom, who happens to be in on this session as well, in the form of Mary, Mary's my mother-in-law. I love her dearly. And from day one, we've always got on. Yes, we might have a, a difference of opinion about certain things, but I think we're really very lucky because the saying that you're not just marrying your partner, but you're marrying their family, really holds a lot of water and I'm sure that that's relevant whether it's a blended family or, or not a blended family you're never going to get it right all the time I know plenty of people who really don't have much time for their in-laws and I guess that's just part of life you can't be be happy with everybody and everybody isn't going to be happy with you all the time hey mum yes that's true very true and I do love you very much Paul you're oh, like my own you. son Oh. Can I can I please ask um, Elsa a question? Um, so if a family has, like you say, that it's the step arrangement, the step family. Now the children are say about six, five, and fourteen, and they go they 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 go from the mother. Let's say um, every second weekend they go to the father. Now when they go to the father, the children are influenced by the mother because she is putting stuff in their heads to not accept the new partner. How do you deal with that? So Mary, again, this is a good question. And this is where uh, sometimes I had a situation where I had the, the father and the mother, although they divorced already and there's other partners involved, I had to bring those two parents in to say, sometimes we take our hurt and we, we pass it over to our children. But we have to remember that we are the adults. Does, it does not matter how old our kids are. Even if they're 30 and we are 50 or 60 when we get married again, they are still the kids. We have to re remind ourselves of that. And if we want, to, uh, want our children to have a decent, positive impact on life, and if we want to change the next generation, 
because we've now gone through divorce and we've put our children through that hurt. We're not going to have a positive impact on them or their generation if we um, pass over negative words. So it takes a, a mom and a dad with EQ to really understand that this, this situation with the, the ex-partner has is, got nothing to do with my child. We have to keep in mind, no matter what, he will always be my child's father. Always. No matter how I feel about that person, I, myself as the parent, have to separate my feelings towards that person as an ex-partner or spouse and focus on he is my daughter's father. If we can do that, then it makes this process better and it helps the process of co-parenting. Um, my heart is definitely to change the next generation because if we um, instill negative beliefs about a marriage and our children, what are we telling them for their future? What are the, we setting them up to? And this is, this is the, the, the big question that you ask now. Um, how do we handle this? If we have to, we bring both those co-parents into a session. Sometimes you get it where the one co-parent is not um, willing to, to partake in a session like this. But I always say, you cannot change what happens in the other home. But don't get dragged into that. You have your home and make sure you, you, you set up a loving environment where there's trust and love and commitment and where we allow the children to say how they feel about situations. Um, I had a marriage masterclass last Friday with Gustav and, and Alna. They've been doing marriage counseling for years now. And he had such a great example where each of us are entitled to an opinion. Our opinions matter but it's what we do with that opinion when somebody else say how they feel. We have to allow everyone else to say where their opinion is coming from and then work with that. Does that answer your question, Mary? Yes, it does. Um, so now exactly what you've said, I'm experiencing with the client um, where the other partner is not interested. It's, it's just such a, you know, a sad situation because the children get, are alienating themselves from the, the father, even though they go to the father, that they're, they're just not receptive. They, they sort of withdrawing. Um, so it's very difficult for him to try and, you know, instill in them any of the trust and the allowing them. They're scared to talk because they feel that they're scared to say anything in case they lose the mother because she threatens them. It's a very so, sad situation. It's, it's hard, you know. Yeah. Mary, what you said now talks about alienation. And I know there is, you can actually take another parent to, to court. You're not allowed to do that. Um, and again, where we say in the situation that you spoke about where the father does not have the, um, he's not in a position to install trust. I can tell you this, what this father or this person can do, regular, constant contact with these children is the best way to build that trust, first of all. And then secondly, um, this father the, or this person, the best what he can do, he or she can do, is um, get into the, the child's life. How's school going? Who's your friends right now? What are the challenges that you face? Because then the child feels... I'm not supposed to choose now between mom and dad. And, and I grew up in a situation where my parents got divorced when I think I was eight. And I was placed in the middle. And I can tell you the impact that that has on a child. A child will walk with that for the rest of their lives. Because they sort of feel they're responsible now. Because they were put in the middle. My cry to all parents out there is to never, ever do this because you're causing your kids so much harm. Um, if you understand why you are doing this, this comes from your own head. And that says that you have to work through certain things. You need to go speak to someone. Um, these, if you're doing this, it's a sign that you have not worked through things. You also want to be healthy before you go into a next relationship. So give yourself that opportunity to heal and to work through that that heartache or that hurts. 
So please do never use your children. Very valuable advice, Alsha. And I think, like you said, it's about EQ. And if one of the parents doesn't have EQ, and perhaps the one with EQ is listening to this message right now, even though you are not in a blended family, I think it will still be valuable for, for you and your son or daughter to see someone like yourself to assist the child in their blended family, what they are going through, what they are experiencing. Um, you don't have to wait for being in a blended family, I guess, to you know get this advice because I think this is no. very important skills um, to have. So, Marika, I think that's where my passion for this was born, was out of this heartache because we did not see, we were not aware of the common pitfalls, small little things like, for example, I addressed my stepdaughter when we met people, I would say, this is my daughter, and I would call her my daughter. So my intention was showing her that I accept her as my own. But what she heard is, my mom do not matter to you. And only after obviously stepping into this pitfalls and causing and then suddenly experiencing a certain response from her, I'm like, what's going on? If we are um, going, thinking of going into a step family or preparing to blend, um, it's very important to, to personally first reach out to, to myself or if there's another uh, person that focuses especially on um, the, the process that we have to work through. Um, the sooner the better. Please, I always say when I sit with couples, I say, I can tell you what does not work because I've been there. And it caused a lot of hurt, not just for me and my daughter, even for my husband and the stepchildren. Because what happens after we married, the, the parents that we are now, um, should, should I say, having conflict with, I'm, I'm causing my spouse now to choose between me and his children. That's the worst place you want your spouse to be. And then what we have to keep in mind now, the kids precede the wedding. So the more intense this conflict, the thicker the blood. It's natural instinct that my partner would stick with his children. My expectation was that my partner and I will be one. <laughs> that comes very hard in a state family because the children, they know their dad longer than that compared to the time that we know each other. And we, if we prepare and if we are aware of this, then we can navigate those challenges. And it's so important to know that there is someone like yourself that can assist you know, someone through this process because I didn't know this type of therapy even existed. I mean, a marriage in itself is difficult enough. I mean, what is the statistics at the moment for, for second marriages, for example? So um, I'll give you the, the statistics, and it's very heartbreaking. I think that's why a lot of people are not choosing to get married or they get married a lot later in life. So first marriages, we're sitting at, the, I think that the statistics is around 55% in South Africa. Second marriages, it jumps to 70, between 70 and 75%. But one, keep in mind, if there are children involved in this next second marriage, the, the divorce rate jumps to 80%. So you want to give yourself the best possible opportunity of making the second of marriage, or sometimes it's even a third marriage, a success. And I always say, when I sit with couples, I say, you made a commitment to your, to your partner or your spouse with the day you got married. But what way stronger, your commitment to God or your commitment to the spouse? my commitment to God, because I made it in front of God. And that's the only thing sometimes when the wheels fall off, that's the only thing that's going to keep us standing and not run away. Because my commitment outweighs the challenges that we face now. And I went through that. I mean, um, it's hard. You, sometimes when you're in that situation, you just want to pack up and, and, and leave. You, you long back. I always say like the Israelites, when they long back to Egypt. Because that, that was known to them. It was better when it was just me and my daughter. The challenges, I could, I could manage them. But now some of the challenges, I don't have any control over. For example, if I get into a conflict with a stepchildren, uh, a stepchild, and the ex-spouse phones my spouse, then it escalates. 
And it's in those situations that you need to know, what do we do? Do I step back? How do I hand, handle this? And what do we, how do we navigate this? So yeah, it's really important to make sure that we are aware of the challenges. Aisha, um, how did you come to the seven years? Uh, earlier on, you said it takes about seven years for the whole process to evolve. Is so, that from your own experience? No. So I'm going to show you some books. I hope you can see. No, I can't see. Can you not see? You have to read it. It's then blurred out. Okay. So what happened is, Mary, and that's again a very good question. So I had the expectation that we're going to be, the, the, the moment we say, I do, um, we're going to be an instant happy family. Like um, so many animation stories we saw, the Brady Bunch is a good example of a story mm. that we saw on television and we were conditioned that it's an instant happy family. If we think about a movie, the sound of music. I mean, this lady took how many kids in and they were instant, they were happy. Life doesn't work like that. So obviously the moment we we hit the, I think the, the first, um, I should say, uh, pitfall, I started reaching out and then I came across um, a church in America, Family Life, but they had a specific division called Family Life Blended. So Ron Aldeo is the writer of this these books and it's called The Smart Step Family, The Smart Step Marriage. It's even, I've got all the books, The Smart Step Dad, The Smart Step Mom. And in these books, it spoke about those key challenges that you face. And like I said, he also mentioned, depending on the age of the children, depending on the dynamics of the single life that these children experience, that all depends how long this um, process is going to take. I can say personally, and, and in his book, he said it can take up to seven years. Some step families, they never bond. For some reason, because I, I don't know, for us, for our step family, it's now we in in our fourth year with my husband and I've been together seven years, but we married four, four years now. I can see now we saw sort of okay getting the hang of it. I've given my children their space, I've allowed my stepchildren to to navigate the relationship and the development of the relationship at their terms and at their time. Initially, I forced that. And I can tell you that does not work. That relationship between the step parent and the step child comes at the child's time, not at my time. Because remember, they did not choose me. And therefore, we have to take that into account. So Mary, uh, there's a lot of books from Ron Aldil. He is the, one of the people that I can really refer you guys to. If you want to go read books, if you want to get audio books, his audio books are available on, I think, Google Play Store. Um, there is even a book called In Their Shoes. And this book talks about the children from the books and how, they, how they've experienced it. And that gives us a little bit more perspective of what our kids have gone through. Because, because if we sit now and I ask you, for example, Paul or um, Mareka, did you guys ever work through the emotional trauma that you, your kids experienced after the boss? Did you? Yeah, not, not really. I think in, in, in our situation, look, firstly, I was, I was not married. Um, I had children out of wedlock, Matthew and Jessica Page, their mom, Karen. Uh, so marriage, I guess, in essence, we were married, but we weren't married in terms of whatever level of commitment that brings. Um, and I think although the children were very much a part of the process and were very much my focus in those early years, and, and, and thankfully were also very much the focus of Xena, I think you're probably right in that there wasn't really a formal process that we went through. I guess that, that's what you're asking. Did we send yes. them to therapy or have counseling or no? Um, and I think, again, everybody's situation is different. Yeah. I think in my case, uh, both my children at that stage were very young. Uh, Jessica Page, I think, was about two, two and a half. And uh, my son, I think, was about four and a half. And what I will say is that just throughout life, uh, and this is going back many years, Matthew now turns 20 this year and my daughter's 17. I have seen how 
that difference in age when this all happened, I've seen now how that has put each of them on a different path into their lives. And I guess what I'm saying is the younger, in my experience, the younger you are when you go through something like this, the better you're able to adapt. I did see my, my son, I think, took quite a bit more adjustment than my daughter. Of course, people are different, so that could just be a personality thing, but our experience is that it was definitely easier when they were young. Yeah. And Mareka, maybe from your side? Uh, I actually only recently um, actually, you know, helped them through coaching, not myself, uh, that a coach assisted them, um, but not initially, but eventually I did because I could see the effect, you know, that it had on them. Um, that they didn't know how to deal with the emotions. So it it might seem like your children are difficult, um, you know, maybe angry, rude, you know, those type of qualities, but there's, there's hurt behind that. So I did recently yes. at least. <laughs> Mareka, that's a brilliant um, question that you mentioned now. So, uh, and you spoke about this, you see the child and you see anger, You see, that's what we see. And sometimes if we're not... Um, aware we we react to the anger instead of thinking that anger is a secondary emotion there's a deeper rooted feeling here and and what we see in the, um, kids from the balls the more loss they experience the more hurt they experience and the because they don't have the emotional intelligence what to do with these emotions comes across as anger so the step parent might say but my the the, the stepchild is doesn't have uh, um, should we say um, decent discipline or doesn't have uh, good qualities the child is rude the whole time it doesn't but it's not that the child sometimes does not have the emotional intelligence to say this is what I'm actually feeling so we as the parent when you see the anger ask your child what are you feeling because when we, we say what are you feeling then we get behind the, the, the situation and behind the, the deeper rooted seat, that feeling. So, Paul, you also spoke now about your son and your daughter, the way they experienced this differently, and that it took your son a little bit longer. So even Ron Deal, and I still don't know till today, Ron Deal, even in his books, he talks about the boys from divorce, they handle it more intense. They struggle. The, the boys in, in divorce, they struggle more than the girls. But where you see, the, see it in the girls is the moment that parent get married again. Then that emotion comes out in the girls. So, and again, yeah, and you said the younger the kids are, I think the easier it is for them to adapt. Um, I can talk from my own experience, my own ignorance. My daughter was eight months old when her, her father walked out of the house. And I was on maternity leave for five months. So I thought the father, I always said her father never really featured. So I kept on saying that she never experienced loss. What a big lie I was telling myself. Because when my daughter came to the age of nine, 10, I immediately saw the type of boy she was longing to, to get attention. And it's actually, she was longing for that relationship with her dad. So please, it's, do not make my mistakes. I always say, I, can, I think I can write a book on what not to do because I've done all that and more. <laughs> so if you can, take your children to somebody that they can help them. If you don't necessarily have the, the financial um, backing to take your kids to, to somebody, just ask, there's a lot of information on the web. Questions, how are you feeling? Where do you feel this in your body? And to draw a picture, um, I had a couple last week here where the, the girl draw a picture of the mom and of the mom. And if you look at the picture, it's the it's just a picture of the mom standing like this. But it's one of those pictures that you can actually pull out. <laughs> and it looks so funny. I actually asked if I could keep it, and I had that now. So you see the picture of this mom, and you see sort of a certain pattern on the mouth. But when you draw this picture out, the, the girl has drawn the mom's mouth this big and you can see the tonsils at the back. So she's saying how much the mom screams. That's what she's seeing. But what you see on the surface is just mom. Mom, she opened it up. 
you see how she experienced this. And that for me, I mean, I was so enlightened by this picture. I said, please, parents, ask your kids to draw a picture. Ask them how they see this family, even the step family. You will get a lot of insight into what they draw, how big or how small they drew, draw the step parents, where they place them will also give you a very big indication of how they feel. I hope that helps you. Can I ask one more, just one more question? Marika, yes, is that okay yes. with you? Because um, I know we're we, we time restrained. So I also had stepchildren and 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 the the relationship was amazing the first year. The little boy was six and his sister was about nine years older. The, girl, the, the daughter connected with me straight away because she didn't have a relationship with her mother. Her mother was drinking. Okay. And um, the stepson, he was doing everything he can to jeopardize our relationship. And if only I knew this then, yeah. I would have handled it so much more better because I kept thinking that he he didn't like me and I didn't do any harm to him. I just wanted to love him. He was doing a weird things. The behavior was stealing from me, hiding my important things, um, telling lies to his mom, saying that I'm hitting him, you know, things like that. So parents must also be aware that children will act out their behavior a bit to jeopardize the relationship. And Mary, if we understand why they do that, it makes sense. And that's where I always say, I'm, the biggest mistake I ever did was not realizing the hurt that our stepson was feeling in this process because he lost the unity between mom and dad. The moment we get married, that idea that mom and dad might reconciliate is gone. That dream is gone. Now they feel that you might also take their father. And therefore they're going to, and it's natural instinct. We're going to push that person out. If I feel threatened by that, it's normal. But the key to remember here, it's never personal. It's about the position that you've taken in. Sometimes these children long for a relationship with their mom. And especially now where the mom did not feature, you are a trigger of the relationship you will never have with his mom. And if we understand that, and I had to learn that the hard way, um, my stepson was a trigger of things that I never experienced and things that he never is gonna have again. And that gives us, I always say, a little bit more grace for them in that moment when they act out, in that moment where they are rude to you. I always say, when I did everything the wrong way and I had to come to a point where I had to make it a, a, a personal situation or I had to go and pray about this. And I had to come to a point where I had to say, okay, up until now, was the way I was handling this step family, was it working? And I had to admit, no. And I had to come to a point where I was going to say, am I willing to try something different? Is it worth it? Definitely. I had to go through that for a reason. Today, I'm very grateful for that. In that moment, if you don't have the skills and you don't have the tools and you don't know where the, the emotions are coming from, it's hard. If anybody out there is going to think about moving into a step family or go into an extra, an, a new relationship and there is kids involved, even if it's just one child, please do not think it's easy. It's not. I, it's not. We have to also take into account the birth or the change that happens. And that's something we did not even touch on, but maybe next time we can, we can talk about that. But even birth or the change, that has an effect on the children. No, thank you, Asha. I really think um, a next discussion will be great because there's so much elements, you know, that plays a role in blended families. And I think it's a very important, you know, that you empower yourself and get the right skills and tools because it's difficult. No matter who you are, no matter what relationship, you're going to hit that hard patch. It's difficult. <laughs> you know, it's a challenge. It's how you approach it that makes a difference. 
So if people want to get hold of you and get in touch with you, where can they find you? So um, Mareke, they can either send me an email on info at remitecoaching.co.za. Um, I have a Facebook page as well. I have a web page. Um, the web page is called remitecoaching.co.za. And um, Facebook page is also there. And or they can reach out to me on cell phone on 072-763-2485. And um, the spelling, thank you, Alsha, of Remind Coaching. Yeah. So it's very easy to remember. It's to remind yourself. So remindcoaching.co.za. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Alsha. Thank you for having me this morning. Yes, Paul. I was just going to thank you very much for your time. And uh, I think these conversations were all, often left short for time, but that's a good place to be because it means we can look forward to welcoming you to another one in future. If you have been watching this on the live stream on Facebook and you have any comments or questions, obviously we won't be able to answer them right now, but please do post them in the comment section below. And that just helps us to, I guess, uh, give you a little bit more value out of these sessions. I think conversations like this are best when they are two way and not just us talking at you. So. If you do have any questions, comments, perhaps you have an experience that you would like to share with your blended family and you think those insights could be helpful to others, well, the platform for doing that is obviously on the Facebook page where you can write all of those comments. And this has been another edition of the Coaching Hour brought to you in partnership with Coaches Network South Africa. Speaking of Coaches Network South Africa, Mareka, uh, we're on Facebook, so you can head across to that page as well. Yes? Yes, Facebook, and we are also have our YouTube channel, and then obviously our Spotify um, podcast channel. As always, thanks for setting it up. You see, Mareka works very hard behind the scenes setting up all of these interviews, and uh, we do get some of the best coaches around who give up their time to come and share their experiences with you. So thank you for that. Mary, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll just thank you so much for your with amazing input i'm sure that it's going to reach far and wide thank you thank you mary marie Kapoor. thank you for for having me this um this morning again i said my heart is to change the next generation and if anybody have questions they're more than welcome to reach out but i'd like to thank you guys for opening up um uh, should i say this can of worms the realistic life real life of what's happening in step families and that is the norm of our life in south africa today so making people aware um thank you for for taking the time to invest in this topic thank you thank you thank you very much and we'll look forward to your company uh, on the next edition of the coaching hour from us cheers for now <laughs>